Hi, everyone. This is Nathan with People's Town Hall. Uh, you may also recognize me as Nathan with Town Hall Project. Uh, Town Hall Project and its vital work tracking the public schedules of every single member of Congress on townhallproject.com uh, continues. And uh, we have enjoyed uh, hosting our own uh, virtual town hall series over the last year. Uh, we are uh, launching this entire new branded project called People's Town Hall. Uh, the events are going to be the same. The core commitment to nonpartisan substantive dialogue is the same. Uh, so nothing's really changing. We're just uh, excited to, to brand this a little bit differently. Um, I also, I'll refrain from editorializing uh, on whether it's a good piece of legislation or a bad piece of legislation or somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I think it's safe to say um, Congress this past week uh, passed one of the most significant pieces of legislation uh, that I can remember, uh, the American Rescue Plan, uh, going to impact nearly everyone's life in some way, big or small. Um, and I know it was a, a, a grueling <laughs> process getting it across the finish line with some late nights and uh, at least one late night that became a, a next day of uh, Votorama. Uh, so I hope you got a little shut eye, Senator Wyden, um, but glad to have you back in Clatsop County. Uh, and thanks for joining us for the town hall today. Nathan, thank you so much. And to People's Town Hall for, in effect, throwing open the digital doors, making it possible for folks to weigh in as we all look forward to the chance to do those open to everybody town hall meetings uh, in person. I've had 970 of them. Nothing better than to have Oregonians look you in the eye and tell you how they see things. And I really am looking forward to that. That's, that's going to be special. I also want to today thank the historian. Uh, I'm in their offices today. Uh, they're, uh, in effect, uh, providing a venue where I can pop open my laptop and then hear from everybody on uh, the coast. I'm just going to have a couple of quick comments, and then we want to uh, take questions. I flew home uh, to Portland at the end of the week. As you said, it has been a challenging few days. I was on the floor basically for over 24 hours uh, as the uh, chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. We had more than half of the bill, and I will just um, tell you, my view is this relief package is an essential booster shot for Oregon and for our schools and our workers and our small businesses and our health. I think this bill gives us a chance to see better days ahead. And I can only tell people who are following us today, if the Senate, if the Senate hadn't provided this booster shot this weekend would sure be looking different for the Oregon coast and for our state. Now, with respect to my role in all of this, my goal was always to secure the strongest possible package for Oregonians, for workers, for small businesses, for the schools, and especially for our health. Uh, also as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, through this package and the original legislation for those who'd been laid off through no fault of their own, I put together what is clearly the biggest package of jobless assistance in history. The biggest uh, package, the combination of $600, the help uh, for gig workers, the self-employed independent uh, contractors. Uh, there's not been a package of help for the jobless uh, like uh, like this. And particularly the most recent one is going to extend uh, unemployment insurance into uh, September. And it will also provide $10,200 worth of tax forgiveness for the typical person who has uh, been uh, using these benefits to pay rent and groceries when they've been laid off through no fault of, uh, of their own. But there's a lot more in this package as well. Nearly $5 billion uh, for Oregon, uh, including a billion dollars in new payments for rural counties and tribes. About 779,000 Oregon kids benefit from expanded tax credits. Uh, a down payment uh, on a pioneering new program in mental health called CAHOOTS. 
where mental health officials and law enforcement work together. And uh, we're also gonna keep pushing to tie unemployment benefits to economic conditions on the ground. So those are just some of the highlights. I know there's a lot of things people wanna cover, including relief help for the fishing industry, the need for the Federal Maritime Commission to investigate reports of unreasonable practices by ocean carriers. And let's just use that as an opening salvo and get everybody's questions. Terrific. Uh, so we are in Clatsop County, Oregon, uh, and we have a selection of Oregonians uh, chosen on the substance of their questions. We don't ask people's party affiliation. We don't ask who they voted for or if they voted. Uh, so uh, Senator Wyden has not seen these questions and uh, looking forward to uh, a robust dialogue today. Uh, first up, we have Judith from Astoria. Judith, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, good afternoon. Pre President Wyden, um, Senator Wyden. <laughs> Sorry, just a little slip of the tongue there. Um, I want to say congratulations on the passage of the COVID relief bill. It's very exciting. Personally, I'm excited about the idea of cutting the poverty level for children by 50%, which is one of the, the, the hopeful outcomes of that COVID relief bill. I think that would be fabulous. Um, um, as Nathan said, I'm in Astoria, and um, my question for you is about um, Astoria's old and historic homes and the need for additional housing in the area. Um, walking through the neighborhood the other day, there was I noticed there's quite a few houses that are empty and in need of repair, and they are beautiful old homes, um, perhaps historic homes, and they could be rehabilitated for additional housing stock. Rehabbing those type of houses are is very expensive. And are there any matching funds or similar to be able to fix up these homes for homeowners and renters? Yes, there are. And as chairman of the finance committee, one of the things that we're looking at is expanding the historic uh, tax credit. Uh, the historic tax credit has long been a vital tool to preserve history and create jobs and drive economic growth in communities. And as the country, and of course, Oregon looked to rebuild from the devastation caused by COVID, I think the historic uh, tax credit is a uh, very valuable uh, tool to help us get folks back to work and preserve, preserve our historical wonders. So at the finance committee, we are looking at how we can improve it, how we can expand it. My argument, Judith, to the president has been that this is an ideal a tool for building back better. In other words, that has been the central kind of theme of coming out of COVID and looking at the big challenges uh, ahead. And certainly in places like Astoria, where the city has invested in building up Main Street and tourism, uh, and the history of this unique place, uh, given what's happened and the hit recreation has taken, building back better, it seems to me, could offer a true small business lifeline through this particular tax credit program. And I'm gonna push for it hard. Great, great, thank you very much. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, next up, we have Jessica. Uh, Jessica? you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, Senator Wyden, how are you? Here you are. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, so to follow up on Judith's question, I actually have questions around housing policy as well. In the stimulus package passed in December and the most recent package that you just managed to accomplish this past week, we've got over $500 million of rental assistance funneling to Oregon. And I'm wondering what you're going to do to work with your state partners to make sure that that aid, that rent assistance is distributed quickly and efficiently. Um, I think the need has been pressing and unfortunately some of the programs that have been working towards distributing those funds haven't executed it well over the past year. Your, your point is, is well taken because the fact is um, we were in a housing crunch. We were in a housing crisis before the pandemic and the pandemic has just uh, compounded it. So uh, certainly if there were to be no 
federal assistance for the renters and, and the homeowners who again are struggling through no fault of, of their own, we would be seeing a tsunami of evictions and in fact, even greater than we have seen. Now, in the American Rescue Plan, which uh, as I say, more than half of it went to the Finance Committee and we work closely with Sherrod Brown, the chairman of the Housing and Banking uh, Committee. That legislation is gonna send Oregon over $230 million in emergency rental assistance and about $35 million in assistance for homeowners. That's on top of the money that we're still focused on in terms of December, the $280 million for rental assistance for Oregon. So if you kind of put these pieces together, um, the enhanced unemployment that, that I mentioned, the economic impact um, payments, the help that folks can get uh, through their uh, utilities, I think then we're in a position to be able to move more quickly than we have in the past. I have been talking to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, for example, about ways in which Treasury can work with the state and local communities to get this critical rent relief into people's pockets as quickly as possible. Uh, also, there's an expansion of the low income housing tax credit, what's called LIHTC, um, by placing a minimum floor on the value of the 4% um, credit. I think we're gonna get a lot of uh, people interested in making those kinds of investments. And LIHTC has been something that uh, residents have liked and developers. And apropos of this point, I think you're talking about, which is getting the help out more quickly. I've got the message loud and clear because I have said, you can have the best priorities in your heart in terms of unemployment and housing and healthcare. But if you haven't done the implementation, then people still aren't able to get on with their lives and get on with their dreams. So message sent, and I want you to know, as chairman of the finance committee, where we had much of this legislation, and where Sherrod Brown and I are working very closely together on housing, I am gonna watchdog the implementation of this every single day. Fritz Graham, by the way, is here from our office and uh, call him nights and weekends and uh, just let us know if there are um, any areas where you think we can speed it up. Because I understand clearly that if there's a big gap between writing a bill and getting it into people's hands, that still means that folks can't get on with their life. Uh, exactly. I mean, I think the expansion of um, resources at OHCS would be critical and be able to get that. I'd be happy to have a follow up conversation about some of the challenges with the landlord compensation fund. Um, I'm literally still working on the first round development changes in the software this weekend um, in conjunction with them. And they, they've done everything they can with the resources they currently have. However, they don't have enough people to be able to execute this well. So I appreciate your attention to that. You also mentioned the expansion of the LIHTC credit and making sure that affordable housing is funded in the future. What do you see on the horizon? What is HUD going to do to start investing in housing infrastructure over the next few years? Um, obviously, there's been a gap in funding for quite a while that is, the states have tried to make up, for it, and it hasn't been able to catch up quickly enough. Well, there, there have been few parts of government, in my view, that got uh, more short shrift than housing under Donald Trump. And I think we remember when we were trying to even deal with getting the agency's attention to radon, which is a serious health question. I mean, you just couldn't get them um, moving. So I think this is going to be a very different kind of time in housing. And um, you talk about the, the question of you know, homelessness. I mentioned the CAHOOTS program, which I think is going to be a pioneering effort for um, people who are on the streets. And, and to a great extent, uh, the challenge of mental health has been made worse by COVID. And we see it with older people. We see it with students who haven't reacted well in terms of learning online or, or in homes where uh, folks are of modest means and they haven't been able to get uh, good quality broadband and, uh, and the like. So uh, in a lot of these programs, um, housing is one, unemployment insurance. I mean, the package that I wrote, and it's probably one of the most important things I've ever done, that got $600 extra per week. And this got out to 
thousands and thousands of Oregonians, more than $2 billion just with that program. We were still facing the fact that our state and others were having problems getting the checks out the door. And they had people on the phone for hours and hours waiting and the like. So you mentioned the software in one of the programs that are you're associated with. I, I remember a conversation I had with uh, then the Secretary of Treasury, and he said, oh, Ron, you're a tech guy. You know, this uh, technology is out, outdated, this COBOL program, what, 10, 20 years old? I said, try 50 years old, Mr. Secretary. So we're including funds in these programs as well to start replacing the technology. And if you'll get to Fritz what you all need on the housing front here on the coast, let me know. Thank you. Thanks so much Thank for you. joining us, Jessica. Uh, next up, we have Gary from Astoria. Gary, feel free to unmute. The plight of Zoom life. <laughs> what happens when you are muted? <laughs> uh, Senator, thank me. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. Um, I'm 70 years old, and uh, like a lot of Oregonians, I get Social Security and a small pension. My wife and I have saved uh, money for years to be able to retire comfortably, uh, but we hadn't counted on the um, uncertainty of medical conditions. The last year of my medical, uh, well, my, I, I've declined a little bit. Um, and in 2020, uh, we found ourselves in Clatsop County in a situation where there was only one insurance carrier for uh, people like myself. Uh, and that was uh, Humana. Moda had pulled out. And when they did, uh, that meant that I had to uh, take on the responsibility out of pocket for myself, paying for generic uh, oxycodone uh, ER. Um, I was appalled the other day when I went to the uh, pharmacy to refill my prescription and found that uh, I had to pay $452.25 out of pocket for a generic drug. I don't care how much money a person saves in his lifetime, that's a crunch. And uh, just to give you an example, there are six pharmacies in the local area they go anywhere from $452 at the low level all the way up to $700, $712 at the high level. There's no inexpensive place to procure this drug. And it's all the same stuff. It's generic oxycodone. What are your thoughts? What can we? Well, Gary, Gary I think you change that. If, if anything, you've you've understated it. You said that when you're going to the pharmacy, you feel like you're in a crunch. I, I think what happens when seniors on the Oregon coast and and across our state go to the pharmacy counter, they feel like they're getting mugged because these prices are just going through the stratosphere. Now, uh, particularly for commonly used drugs. And you mentioned oxycotton uh, uh, and uh, I've been uh, going after the ripoffs in insulin. You know, we've got millions of um, people in this country who face diabetes and, and the like, and insulin prices are up 12 fold uh, in recent years. And the drug isn't 12 times better. It's basically the same thing. Now, I do think we've got some help coming up. Uh, in 2019, I worked with Chuck Grassley, the Republican Senator from Iowa, and we put together a bill that could stop seniors like you from getting clobbered at the pharmacy counter. What we said 
is for these commonly used drugs, the pharmaceutical companies couldn't raise their prices above inflation. There was a cap. And if they raise their prices above inflation, then in effect, they were going to lose some of their subsidies, the, uh, the extra tax goodies and the like they were getting, they'd lose uh, some of this. And what the Congressional Budget Office found is the bill will lower Medicare premiums for seniors like you. It'll save nearly $95 billion for taxpayers. It'll lower your out-of-pocket you know, costs. And by sending a message to big pharma that there is going to be consequences for raising prices for these commonly used drugs, like the ones we're, we're talking about, I think is gonna be a real deterrent uh, to gouging. Now, there are other steps that I favor as well. Uh, there is a ridiculous uh, rule that prevents Medicare from negotiating to help seniors like you to hold down um, prices. And I favor that as well. So the combination of the bipartisan bill with Chuck Grassley, it caps um, pharmaceutical prices at uh, the rate of inflation, plus lifting the restriction on Medicare so that Medicare can negotiate to hold down the cost of medicines. I think that one-two punch starts to change uh, the marketplace so that you get a better deal at the pharmacy counter rather than a mugging. Well, uh, that's all well and fine, but is there a timeline on this? What, when could we expect well, something like this to take place? A great, a great question. That is exactly the issue. So Senator Grassley and I, Republican and a Democrat, we got it through the Finance Committee uh, in the earlier Congress. One person blocked it from going to the floor, Mitch McConnell. Now, as you know, the Congress has changed hands. And I can tell you the leadership of both the House and the Senate is committed to getting action now on holding down prices. So I'm gonna under promise, but we're sure gonna focus on delivering and we would have gotten it last time. If Mitch McConnell had allowed a bipartisan bill, one Republican, one Democrat to get a vote on the Senate, you'd be enjoying lower prices today. Thank you. I have one more quick question. Of course. Why please. do, do why do, why do insurance care. companies limit? I mean, here we are, one one insurance company in all of Clatsop County. I don't understand. Gary, I want to ask one question that'll help me answer this. Are you on Medicare now or are you not yet Medicare eligible? I'm on Medicare now. So what you're talking about is you would like to be able to get a supplement in your county, Clatsop, to fill in the gaps in your Medicare, what is called usually Medigap, is that right? Well, I, I have a supplement, but yes. the insurance company does not allow for that particular medication to be covered. Got it. Got it. And as a result, I am not allowed to uh, fall into the Medigap, the Medicare Gap program, because it doesn't. Donut, donut, it donut hole. You're not in the donut, donut hole. hole. I'm not allowed to do it. I'm going to spend over $5,000 on one medication, and I take several. Uh, Senator. Gary. Go ahead. No, please, you. I, I want to hear you. Well, then I'll comment. Uh, I, all, all I'm saying is that, you know, I'm just a common, ordinary man. I worked hard all my life. I don't want to give it all to the pharmaceuticals and the insurance companies. Yeah. So, Gary, I don't know if you know about and that's my where I'm at. But thank you. I was director of the Gray Panthers, a senior citizens group for about I seven years that. before. So I, I have spent my adult life fighting big pharma and the insurance you know, people. And I think it's a disgrace that people like you who've worked your whole life 
are still kind of weeding through all this red tape and bureaucracy just so you can afford your medicine. Now, you've given me a couple of um, areas to follow up on. And if you'll get us a phone number and or an email or something, we'll be back to you tomorrow. But I think there are a number of areas, both with respect to insurance um, coverage. I also want to see um, if uh, Part D of Medicare might be of some help to you. Just give us until tomorrow to work on it. But I will just tell you, um, we're spending $3.8 trillion a year now on healthcare. We can afford to make medicine affordable for people like you. And this is my top priority right now for seniors. Top priority. And if I'll tell you, if Mitch McConnell hadn't blocked our vote, you'd be getting relief from some of your medic medicine bills right now. Right now, you'd have relief. Okay? So you'll get you'll get a phone number and an email to uh, to town hall, and then we'll be back at you. Fritz will be back at you tomorrow. Okay. Here we'll we'll pass your information along. So thank you for joining okay. us today. Uh, next up, we have uh, Carol and Larry from Gearhart. Hi, Senator Wyden. Um, thank Hi, you for Carol. answering my question today. Um, I am um, frustrated over this COVID pandemic and um, trying to get a vaccine is just seems to be um, very frustrating. Um, I've heard other, other states have, um, you know, federal buildings set up mm. or FEMA buildings set up, um, you know, to distribute vaccines and I just feel like our county here is kind of um, lacking in services. Um, I have a rare lung disease. I'm only 61 years old. Um, according to Oregon's Health Authority, I am eligible um, no later than March 29th, and which means I guess I have to just keep checking to see if I ever will be eligible by then. Um, according to Oregon Health Sciences, Oregon Health Sciences University, I am eligible. And when I try to sign up for a vaccine, the appointments are usually all taken within minutes. Um, so I'm not able to get a vaccine. And I would kind of like to get one because I have a rare lung disease and I also have a heart condition. So. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what is Oregon doing to what? what what's Oregon doing and FEMA to, to try to help us get a vaccine here in Classic County? Yeah, there are a number of, of points to this, Carol. And let's kind of give the update for folks too. Um, in the uh, president's speech, a couple of nights ago, he said he's going to have everybody eligible by May 1. Now, you have gone through months and months and months, and clearly you're um, somebody who uh, is particularly concerned, and rightfully so, because of the health conditions that you have. And I'll just tell you, I think the fact that the Trump administration did not use the Defense Production Act so that we could get more vaccine out across the country. That was, in my view, a significant factor in uh, the tardiness of getting some of these vaccines out across the country. I mean, if you look at what we've been dealing with in Oregon, and as you know, this has been a state judgment about you know, the queue and the like, every time I hear about teachers being pitted against seniors and seniors being pitted against, you know, someone, you know, like yourself who's been waiting and waiting. I say, my God, if you get enough vaccine out across the country, you make this whole debate irrelevant because there's enough vaccine to go around. And then 
the question becomes, how do you get it in people's arms? In other words, you have the vaccine, you get it in people's arms. A couple of things, um, Senator Merkley and I have been um, pushing federal health authorities, what's called HRSA, to set up um, centers, which they have begun in order to get um, these services out. I also think we ought to use the live venue sites, which I thought were a natural since we've got a lot of them that aren't being used now. But I mean, the fact is for literally months and months, we didn't have anybody in charge. You know, one day it was Jared Kushner, the next day, you know, the state was gonna do it, the next day was gonna be something else. So uh, suffice it to say, I'll tell you what I've seen my role is primarily is to get as much vaccine out to Oregon as we could to help with what's called the PPE, the protective you know, equipment, um, and then also to help with the healthcare workforce. But if you'll give us um, a phone number and an email, we'll get on the phone. And if you've got some indication that you'll um, be able to get your shot on March 29th, it's a state thing, but we'll get on the phone and we'll go to bat for you. Did you want to follow that up? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I will. Oh, I meant with a question. We'll follow it up with um, with uh, afterwards and do everything we can to make sure that that March 29th date actually happens. Sounds great. Thanks for joining us. Thank right. you. Carol. I'm sorry. My heart, my heart goes out to everybody who's waiting like you. It's just, it's just heartbreaking to see vulnerable people have to wait. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Carol and Larry. Um, next up, we have uh, Nancy from Astoria. Hi, Senator Wyden. Um, thank you for holding these town halls. I really appreciate the efforts and, and public engagement. And um, today is the one year anniversary of Breonna Taylor's murder. So I'm curious what you're doing to support the Black Lives Matter movement and specifically police reform legislation. Yeah, it's, it's particularly important that we reflect on this because it's literally one year since the fatal shooting in Louisville of Breonna Taylor. And I guess I start with the proposition that those three words are right. Black Lives Matter is a judgment that's true, and it's a long recognition of a fundamental uh, fact. I support the Justice and Policing uh, Act, uh, one that includes measures like uh, opposing uh, chokeholds. But I think there's a lot more that every elected official can do. And let me tell you what I'm focusing on right now. As chairman of the Senate uh, Finance Committee, I am working to root out systemic racism in American healthcare. And these racial disparities in health have gone on for far too long. I mean, I can just tell you, Nancy, I've seen in affluent white suburbs where they have every type of terrific healthcare. And then you see in the black community that healthcare services, it's, it's a healthcare desert in terms of a shortage of uh, services. So I'm really zeroed in on a few key uh, areas. Uh, maternal health, because we see uh, the problem being much more uh, serious for black moms than well, white moms. And I mentioned mental health care and particularly the availability of um, services that uh, we're seeing in great um, demand right now. I also want to um, make a final point with respect to the last few nights uh, in Portland. I've heard this argument that the vast majority of peaceful protesters are the same as the small number of criminals committing these violent acts and breaking windows and um, setting fires and the like. I do not think these are the same. You know, peaceful protesters are working with every fiber of their being towards a justice. And breaking windows, engaging in violence, setting fires is criminal behavior. And I just want people to know that I'm gonna keep standing with black leaders and leaders in all communities of color 
who have also been out there denouncing these criminal acts again and again and again. And it just comes down to one proposition, and this is going to be my view, you know, forever. And that is, I'll stand up for peaceful protest, and I'll, uh, in every way, try to stop uh, violence from any part of the political spectrum from any quarter. Thanks for joining us today, Nancy. Uh, next up, we have Robert uh, in Astoria. Robert, I'm a little slow to get your camera on. You should be ready to go. Good afternoon, Senator. So um, my question is, um, with all the laws being enacted across the country uh, to restrict voter access, um, I was wondering how you feel about introducing legislation to make Election Day a national holiday. Well, I'll certainly look at that. I will tell you my top priority is what I've been working on since 2002, and that is given every single American the chance to vote the Oregon way by mail. I'm the nation's first mail-in United States Senator. Our second Senator to be elected by mail in America is also an Oregonian. He's a Republican, Gordon Smith. And I will tell you that the last election proved the validity of what Oregon has done on a bipartisan basis for 20 plus years. I mean, the fact is that people came up to me over that September and October period and they said, Ron, you know, your bill has become law without it becoming law because we're already voting by mail because we have to in the middle of a pandemic. So I feel very strongly about finding ways to advance this cause and also block efforts to suppress the vote. What is going on right now in Georgia is wholly unacceptable. I think it's just outrageous. I mean, the idea of restricting Sunday voting in Georgia, as my uh, younger children say, hello, dad. I mean, you know, it's obvious what that's all about. It's trying to uh, suppress the, uh, the vote of, uh, of, of black uh, people in the state of Georgia. Yes. So we've got a, a one-two punch here. We've got to stop the efforts to suppress the vote. And then we have to promote uh, fresh ways to expand it the Oregon way works, it's cost effective. We have not had the fraud. I mean, Donald Trump always hollered about fraud, fraud, fraud. Well, A, he uh, voted by mail and B, Dennis Richardson, a Republican, the late Dennis Richardson, very conservative. He always told Donald Trump, we haven't seen any fraud here. So I think the real strategy for the future is to take the Oregon Way National, I'm open to a holiday. I think what's so attractive about the Oregon approach is you've got this block of time to vote when it's convenient for you. That's what's so attractive about it. It's cost effective, we haven't seen fraud, and it's convenient for that person who's working two jobs, who's going to school and, and working, who's got a, a three week old and they're trying to juggle a lot of things in childcare. That's why I like I like the Oregon way. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Robert. Uh, next up, we have um, Rick, uh, who is, I believe, a city commissioner in Warrington. Uh, good morning, Senator. I, as a city commissioner in Warrington, I sit on the group called PSCC, which is Pacific Safety Coordination Council for Clatsop County, which represents all the commissioners, city commissioners in the county of Clatsop. And with that group, or from that group, I'd like to thank you for your, for your stance on the mental health things. Uh, I personally had lost a loved one. And uh, it's really a shame the way the state treats people because I don't know if you're aware of it, but now the state mental hospital, because they couldn't meet their guides, reduced who could get in there. They changed, they moved the goalposts. So now nobody can get into the mental hospital, as I understand, unless they commit a felony. And as the sheriff told me, there are people on the streets who should not be there. They're dangerous, but they haven't done a felony yet. And so I have to applaud you for what you've done, because Oregon has not done a very good job. And 
I, I hate to have to say that, but my group is very concerned about the state mental hospital not being able to get people off the street that need help. You know what I can tell you is there's a lot of history here. As you might recall, some of it goes back to Ronald Reagan days when Reagan said, I'm gonna close the state facilities because we're gonna get everybody places in the community. And people say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And they closed the state facilities, but there weren't places for people in the community. And this issue is deeply personal in the Wyden household, my brother, far and away the smartest of the two Wyden boys, was a schizophrenic. He died way too young. There were years when he was on the street and we worried he'd hurt himself or somebody else. So I'm deeply committed to turning this around. And we have seen an explosion of mental health claims mm -hmm. over this last year. And it's kids for whom online school or no school didn't work out. It's seniors, it's people isolated, it's folks who've been laid off. And right now I'm in the middle of an investigation because I'm not convinced that the insurance companies are honoring parity for people. As you know, the whole point of the parity law was to treat people um, with mental challenges the same way you treated people with physical challenges. So we're going to, make this um, a significant part of the work of the Senate Finance Committee. And I'll tell you, as long as I'm chairman of the committee, um, this idea that mental health is sort of an afterthought and uh, we'll let the insurance companies just tell us what our rights are and the like, not gonna happen on my watch. I don't know if you're aware, Clatsop County has a rapid response team of two people that they send to relief. That. Yes. When I, because I crunched numbers, I talked to my, my, my uh, police chief in Warrington about that because I said, uh, Matt, I fear that if the mental health were, that's needed were provided to the homeless from looking at the numbers, I'm guessing calls would go down about 40%. And I value the police chief's opinion. He turned to me and says, I think you're about right. That's a lot of wasted police time. And, and the, the irony is that the police are the first to tell you that they're not in a position from a training standpoint to do mental health. And uh, I saw an article in one of the national publications the other day talking about our bill and said, finally, some reforms that get uh, support across the political spectrum. And, uh, and that was um, something that told me we were moving in the right direction. Well, the last thing I have is because I work with elected officials in Alaska also, because I'm a professional volunteer, basically, since I'm retired. I don't know if you're aware, but in Alaska, the spending on the on the police prison system surpassed the spending on the education system. So if you see Lisa Murkowski, you might want to mention that to her, that that could be a sign of a problem. I'll tell her. I'll tell her indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm appalled by that sign. Thank you. Well, and, and, and it, it's an indication that so much of the social service system just is still particularly given the amount of pressure that we've seen on it in the last year is in need of, of big, big time reforms. And um, apropos of mental health, you probably heard I proposed taking the CAHOOTS program and embedding it in Medicaid. Medicaid is the largest payer of mental health services for uh, folks of modest income. I think that's a step in the right direction. Yes, I read your article this morning. Thanks for what you do. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Rick. Uh, we do have time for a couple uh, questions from folks who were um, on the Facebook comments. Um, so feel free uh, if you are watching on Facebook, uh, we might have time for one more. Um, so it looks like uh, Bob in Astoria um, has more of a comment than a question, but you might have some thoughts, Senator. Uh, Bob says, thanks for drafting the River Democracy Act. There are critical rivers in the east part of the state that have been designated. We need to find common solutions to dam removal to ensure this proposal bears fruit and keeps wild salmon from going extinct. Well, I, I will just um, tell, um, you said it was Bob, right? Uh, Bob Rees in Astoria. Yeah. 
and and I know of Bob's um, good good work, and uh, I think the way I I characterize it is the River Democracy Act, which is a piece of legislation I uh, recently introduced. When we pass it, will be another Oregon um, first. What we did is we said, you know, the way legislation usually gets considered is somebody asks a few people at home and then they go back to Washington DC and write a bill. We said, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna make sure that we get input from thousands of Oregonians. And we invited people to nominate rivers for the special uh, protection of the wild and scenic uh, rivers legislation it protects them from damming and lining and, and that sort of thing. And look, protecting our rivers is in, is in our DNA. I mean, it literally is something that brings Oregonians um, together and it helps uh, also promote our recreation uh, economic engine. I mean, uh, recreation is now responsible for billions of dollars worth of revenue coming into our state. It is a natural for us to pick up on in terms of, of our economy. And uh, I believe that other states are gonna copy our River Democracy uh, Act in the days ahead and uh, look forward, uh, Bob, to working with you on it. I know you've spent a lot of time uh, focused on natural resources legislation. This is something that brings people together. And by the way, the legislation protects private property with respect to federal land managers, they're required to put together plans that reduce fire risk. I saw some of those fires that, uh, um, I saw what some of those fires did when I was coming uh, today on the drive uh, from Portland. Uh, we've seen a lot of communities hard hit and I think we can uh, uh, do more to protect uh, both our rivers and our communities with, uh, with the River Democracy Act. Great, thanks for the question, Bob, and thanks for your great work. Uh, last question we have is from Laura uh, in Seaside, um, who has, she doesn't have a specific question, but she just says uh, support for ending or at least reforming the filibuster. I'm sure you've got plenty of questions about this, Senator Wyden, but uh, would love to hear your, your latest thoughts. Sure. Let, let's talk about the filibuster and I'll, I'll touch on a couple other things before we wrap up. Um, I am very much for what has come to be known as the talking filibuster. So what supporters of the filibuster have always said is this forces people to get together and try to work legislation out. Opponents of the filibuster say, you know, look, there's just a bunch of stonewalling, let's go to majority um, vote. I will tell you that after Oregon voted twice for death with dignity, in the House of Representatives a number of years ago, they actually passed a bill to overturn what the voters of Oregon had done. And I hadn't been in the Senate very long and very powerful people back there were aligned against Oregon. And I said, look, you may think we're small and 3000 miles away from Washington DC where you think you got all the answers. Uh, you may think we're small but I'm not gonna sit around if you try to roll us. And so I said, you try to pass this in the United States Senate and you better be prepared to come on out and make the case why you wanna overturn what Oregonians have done. And their bill was so bad in the house, they didn't even wanna try and make the case because not only would they have uh, hampered our death with dignity law, they would have made it more difficult for physicians to actually treat patients for pain. I mean, just think about that. That had nothing to do with death with dignity. That's about physicians being able to use their education to treat patients for pain. And just the fact that I said, I'm gonna really make you come out on the floor of the United States Senate and defend your arguments, your argument for getting rid of what Oregonians had voted for really helped us win the day. But I was prepared to go to the floor of the United States Senate and pardon the example, talk for a long, 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 long time. I wasn't gonna say I object and then go off somewhere and play 
golf with somebody, I was going to do what it was going to take to defend Oregon. And we prevailed and didn't actually have to go forward with the whole thing. So I think that is a kind of middle ground. Now, if that's unacceptable to Mitch McConnell, we'll still try to work on bipartisan solutions. But if it's a protest just for the sole purpose of protesting and it has no constructive motivation, you got to get on with the people's business. That respond to your question about the filibuster? Well, it was a written question, so hopefully it does. Uh, Laura, feel free to let us know in the Facebook comments. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, so that is it for our Clatsop County Town Hall. Um, we thank everyone who was able to join us uh, live. Uh, Nathan, Nathan, can I mention one so, issue that hadn't come up and yeah. I thought was going to come up? And Go that ahead. is fishing. Because fishing families are so important to the Oregon coast. They're really the backbone of coastal communities. And they're really, again, sort of part of Oregon's DNA, part of our uh, special character. And a lot of us worked hard uh, to make sure that seafood in the COVID package, the rescue plan, was included among the commodities that can be purchased using the additional $4 billion that the Senate allocated to the Department of Agriculture. We think that this really could be of help to seafood processors on the coast who are really under very difficult pressure to, uh, to be able to stay afloat. Also, uh, the package that uh, was enacted in December included $300 million uh, in disaster fund for fisheries. And that can be used for projects uh, critical to the Northwest. And, uh, and obviously we haven't even gotten in yet to the issue of Oregon uh, small ports. So this is something else I'll be pushing hard to try to address as part of my work on the uh, Senate, uh, Senate Budget Committee. But I did want to make special note of that. I also wanted to note, um, I'm just reflecting on the Black Lives Matter uh, point in justice and policing uh, that that legislation bans no knock warrants. And that was what was at issue in the Breonna Taylor um, shooting that people are reflecting uh, on, uh, on today. And my last point is, is that usually senators or chairs of committees give big long speeches and wrap up and like, I'm just gonna say thank you, thank you. It is a gorgeous day on the Oregon coast. We saw everybody, you know, lined up at stores and other kinds of places. I saw at the, at the fish markets and stuff like that. There were people all lined up, lined up. And I think it just left me with a sense that legislation passed and it's a gorgeous day on the Oregon coast. And you really reflected a little bit on the proposition that there are better, better times uh, uh, ahead. And uh, obviously we're gonna have to keep wearing masks for a while and social distance and the like. But I'll tell you, driving from uh, my place in Southeast Portland to where I'm sitting right, right now, I saw you know, a lot, lot of people taking advantage of another classic beginning of spring day. You know, by, by the way, I'm, I'm trying to get legislation passed so we wouldn't have to always be forwarding our, our watches and our clocks uh, today. And uh, I think uh, making all these changes in your watches and your clock twice a year, just a bunch of confusion. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to see us uh, go to something along the lines of what other countries have done, which is just make a determination once and that's it and you get on with your life. All right, Nathan, big, big thanks to all of you and uh, your efforts in terms of trying to throw open the digital doors as I, I call it. Um, we're gonna keep turning to you even when we can have these meetings um, in, in person, but big thanks for all the good work that you've, uh, you've been doing all these years to make it possible for folks to participate at the grassroots uh, uh, level. And we'll just end the meeting with a big thank you to all of you. Thanks to everybody for 
participating on a, on a gorgeous day. And, uh, and these discussions are in the to be continued department. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.